If you haven't already turned in your homework, turn it in at the front over here. We're going to continue uh, looking at the Zener diode as a voltage regulator. So let's quickly go over what we looked at uh, on Friday. So we have a Zener diode, uh, and we looked at the data sheet for the diode. If you put 6.8 uh, volt reverse bias across it, it will have a current through it of 5 milliamps. Uh, we know the incremental resistance is 20 ohms, and the Zener knee current is going to be 0.2 milliamps. And we're going to use it as a voltage regulator for this load. Um, and we're going to hook it up to a DC supply that has a, a ripple of uh, plus or minus 1 volt uh, around a constant 10 volt uh, output. Okay, so we're going to figure out line regulation, load regulation, and if this regulator will work properly if the load resistance is half a kilo ohm. Okay, so we first look at um, the circuit by replacing that Zener diode with the equivalent circuit for Zener diode, which was just a DC source uh, with a value of VZ0 and a resistance RZ that's equal to the incremental resistance. Okay, so I know that that value is 20 ohms, I just don't know what VZ0 is. So our first step was to solve uh, for VZ0, and we did that by taking this equation, VZ equals VZ0 plus RZ times IZ, and plugging in all the values that we already knew. So we know a value for VZ and, an, and the Zener current at that particular voltage. Okay, so with a uh, Zener voltage of 6.8 volts, I don't know what VZ0 is, but I know what the incremental resistance is, that's 20 ohms, and I know at that voltage across the Zener diode, I will have 5 milliamps of breakdown current flowing through it. So, given all of that information, I can figure out a value for VZ0. So this is 6.7 volts. Okay, and then the next step uh, was to figure out what this current I is. And so let's do that first with no load connected. So I'm going to break uh, that connection. And I just want to know what I is. And because I have no load connected, load connected, I is going to be the same as the current through the Zener diode. And it's just going to be the difference in voltages or the potential drops across both those resistors. Uh, divided by the re total resistance. Okay, so 10 volts minus this was 6.7 volts. This is 20 ohms. And oh, I didn't label it on this slide, but it was on a previous slide that this resistance is, is half a kilo ohm. Okay, so you will get a Zener current of uh, 6.35 milliamps. Now, given this, still with no load connected, what is the voltage across the Zener diode going to be? So we're going to use this equation once again. And now I know what VZ0 is, that's 6.7 volts. I know what IZ is, I just calculated it in step 2, and I know the incremental resistance plus 20 ohms. So now if I solve this, I will get an output voltage of 6.83 volts. And that makes sense because it's close to 6.8 volts and my current is 6.35 milliamps, which is relatively close to this 5 milliamp current. So it, it makes sense that the voltage across the Zener diode is about 6.8 volts. Okay, now let's solve 
the specific problems we had for this voltage regulator, which was the line regulation. So how does the um, voltage at the output change when I start adding the, the ripple onto the DC source? So my DC source is 10 volts, but it can fluctuate by plus or minus 1 volt. Okay, so the fluctuation then in my output voltage is just going to be equal to that fluctuation uh, in my source, and then I just do a voltage divider um, between this incremental resistance RZ and the discrete R that I have here, or the external resistor to the diode. Okay, so plus or minus one volt, RZ is 20 ohms, this R is half a kilo ohm. And so the fluctuation that I will have in V out is now about 40 millivolts. So if I want to convert that to line regulation, I just need to normalize that to the change in, in voltage of my source. And since that change is one volt, um, then it's just uh, 40 millivolts per volt. So for every volt in fluctuation uh, of my source, my voltage regulator will stabilize that so it's only a 40 millivolt change at the output of the voltage regulator. So I had a change of, of if I have a change of one volt at the input to my voltage regulator, at the output of my voltage regulator, it will only change 40 millivolts. So the voltage regulator is helping to stabilize the voltage to whatever load that you have. Okay, uh, for load regulation, that's going to be uh, the change in um, the output voltage as I have a, a change in load current. So we need to solve for this at a particular load current. Okay, so let's, we'll just make an assumption. I'm not making an assumption on the resistance of my load yet, but I'm just going to assume that this load current is going to be one milliamp. Okay, so if my load is now drawing one milliamp, that means that I already solved for a certain value of I, and I said that was equal to IZ. But now I, I that was with my load disconnected. So now I have my load collect connected, and I'm saying it's drawing away one milliamp. One milliamp of this current I is now being delivered to the load. Okay, so that means IZ is now one milliamp less than what it used to be under all the other same conditions. Okay, so let's look at that. So uh, my change in the output voltage is going to be equal to the change in IZ times RZ because my output is going to be equal to VZ0, but that's not going to change as IZ changes. The only thing that's going to change is the voltage that's dropped across RZ. Okay, so the change in, in IZ, because I, I'm now drawing away 1 milliamp to the load, is going to be negative 1 milliamp. And I multiply that by RZ, which is 20 ohms. And so now when I hook up my load resistor that's drawing one milliamp away from my Zener diode, my output voltage is going to drop by 20 millivolts. Or, if you want to express it as load regulation, normalize that um, to the change in the load current. So, for every one milliamp change in my load current, my uh, output voltage is going to drop by 20 millivolts. Okay, so that, that's how your, your voltage regulator is then going to be affected by how much current uh, your, your load is going to draw. So if that's the case, that means 
the value of this load resistor uh, will actually matter. So, can we look at the case, uh, or let's look at the case where our load resistor is a half a kilo ohm, and then this resistor stays at a half a kilo ohm. Okay, so what is going to be the load current now? Can we make an estimate? So without the load, uh, let me write it down here. So V naught, we said for no load, that is 6.83 volts. So let's use this to, to just make a quick estimate on what the load current will be. So what's my load current going to be? What's the equation? This voltage V naught divided by the resistance of half a kilo ohm. Okay, so that comes out to uh, 13.7 milliamps. So is that a problem? This might, this might not be the, the actual load current, but it's in the ballpark. So I'm saying, okay, if my Zener diode is operating the way it used to be without the load there, um, according to Ohm's law, this current is 13.7 milliamps. What was this current? Mm, I don't think it was 5 milliamps. Yeah. The, so we calculated this without the load. When we didn't include the load, that this current would be 6.35 milliamps. Now I put in the load, and I'm saying with the output voltage that I calculated when I had no load, my load is now going to draw about 14 milliamps. So we're still all good? Anything wrong with the circuit? <laughs> okay, so who thinks this circuit is fine and my voltage regulator is okay? It'll work in this situation. Who thinks there's something wrong? Okay, now the question is, what's wrong? Let's do KCL at this point in the circuit. There's too much current leaving this node. So I, I had made an, uh, when, I, when you design the circuit without the load, we're assuming that that current I is equal to IZ. So I have some current going through my Zener diode in this direction, which corresponds to breakdown, right? But if I look at KCL, the current shouldn't be going in, in that direction because I have too much current leaving that node. So IZ should actually be in the other direction in order to satisfy KCL. So that means that the Zener diode is probably not operating in breakdown if we're trying to draw that much current from the Zener diode through that load. Okay, so 
what actually happens. Okay, so we said this is what we just talked about. That the, dial, uh, the current um, through the resistor we calculated and through the, the Zener diode was 6.35 milliamps with no load there and with this equal to 10 volts. Okay, but now it looks like we're, we're trying to draw too much current uh, through my load. So I'm probably not operating the Zener diode in breakdown anymore. But once you move out of breakdown, if we look at the, the diode curve, so there's reverse bias, and then there's breakdown. So breakdown is out here. In order to get my current through my Zener dial to actually flow in this direction, I have to go all the way to the forward bias side, right? I have to, I have to go to forward bias. I'm not biasing it that way because this side of the diode is still at a higher potential. Sorry, the diode picture is not in here. There's a diode picture. That's the orientation of my diode. So the uh, I still am applying a voltage to the diode that is not in the forward bias polarity. Okay, so I probably won't, I mean, I don't have this current going in that direction. That is not going to happen because I don't have the voltage set up to make a forward bias across this in your diode. But I'm also saying it's not in breakdown because it looks like something is wrong with this circuit. So then what is happening is I moved out of this breakdown region and I'm operating this diode under reverse bias when there's no current uh, flowing through the diode. So if there's no current flowing through this diode because it's now only reverse bias and not in breakdown, then I can figure out what my voltage output will be. Um, it's just going to be, now the only current path is going to be through this resistor R and through the load resistor because there's going to be no current through my Zener diode. Okay, so it's just going to be then a voltage divider to figure out what V0 is. And um, the, the voltage is dropping. The voltage that I'm interested in is the one across RL. So 10 volts, and then I do RL, which is half a kilo ohm, and uh, the other R, which is also half a kilo ohm. So it's just half of 10 volts. And my output becomes 5 volts now, in this case. But it, I'm not using my Zener diode anymore. So this output is not going to be uh, well regulated. Any change on my input voltage now, if my Zener diode is not in breakdown, is going to be equal to the change in the voltage at the output. So with this uh, particular load resistor, I don't have the right bias condition across my Zener diode, so my voltage regulator won't work. So if you're going to use a, a, a Zener diode as a voltage regulator, there are some limitations um, that are going to be placed on the resistance of your load. So there's some things that you need to consider. And it's always a good idea uh, when you work with diodes just like how we, when we did the ideal diode and we, we looked at circuits and we just said, okay, I'm going to assume it's forward biased or I'm going to assume it's reverse biased and, and solve the circuit. So same thing here. Once you're done solving the circuit, you got to make sure that your, your initial assumption was right. So I'm going to assume that the Zener diode is operating in breakdown because that's what it's made to do. You want to operate the Zener diode in breakdown. But you have to go back and make sure that it's actually operating in the region that you think it is. Any questions on this? Okay, I'm going to talk about um, two more diode applications. 
but only uh, briefly. So the first one is a, a limiter circuit. And what this circuit does is uh, you can use it to pr protect other electronic components uh, from spikes and voltages. So if you put a limiter at the output of a circuit, it will, will force the output of the circuit to be within a certain voltage range. And you may want to do this, uh, for example, let's say you connect up uh, some kind of sensor to the input of a microcontroller. Um, usually a microcontroller is going to define maximum input voltage. And let's say your sensor, um, if there's a lot of whatever you're sensing, can have a very high output voltage you might want to limit that so that that won't damage your microcontroller. Uh, that's one example of, of where you'd want to, to use a voltage limiter. This is what the output of, of a uh, voltage limited circuit looks like. So the y-axis is the output, the x-axis is the input. And uh, within whatever voltage range you're trying to achieve, the output will just be equal to the input. That's what this curve is showing. But once your input voltage goes past the certain limit that you want to set, at that point, the output voltage will just become constant and it won't become any higher. Or if you're on the negative side, if your voltage drops be below a limit you want to set, then your output will just stop at that voltage and it won't become any lower. Okay, so that's what you want in a limiter or mathematically you can just say that the output of your circuit is going to be limited to some value less than or equal to some maximum voltage and uh, greater than or equal to some minimum voltage no matter what your input voltage is going to be Okay, so for example, if the black curve is my input signal, but I only want to limit my output to some uh, positive swing L plus and some negative swing L minus, if this is my input signal, then this blue curve is going to be the output of the limiter. So when the input voltage is, is higher than the limit that I set, then my output is just going to stop at that limit. Then when, it, when the input voltage goes below the limit, it will track, my output will be equal to the input. And then when my input goes below my negative limit, my output will just stop at that negative limit until the input voltage rises above that negative limit. Okay, and we can create one of these limiters using diodes. How are we going to do that? Can, how, can, how can we make uh, a limiter just using diodes? A forward bias diode and a reverse bias diode. Yes, that's exactly uh, how you would do that. So, there is a simple limiter circuit. Here's your input port. There's a forward bias, or there's one diode in one orientation, another diode in another orientation, and then you, you take the output across that parallel combination of the diodes. And one of these will always be forward biased, and the other one will be in the opposite state. Oh, sorry, one of them will, at least one, of, sorry, let me backtrack. At any given point in time, one diode will be forward biased and the other one will be reverse bias and they could switch between which one is which um, but that's what's giving you uh, the limiting uh, quality so the diode that sets the positive um, voltage limit is going to be diode D1 the diode that sets the negative voltage limit is going to be diode D2 and so let's look at what's happening. So let's look at only diode D1. This is D1. Okay, so if my 
uh, input voltage is negative, what's the bias state of this diode? It's reverse biased, so that means I have no current flowing through the diode. There's no current through this resistor, no voltage dropped across that resistor. So my input voltage and output voltage are going to be equal to each other if this diode is reversed biased. And that's what you see here in this part of the curve. The input and output voltage are equal to each other. Now, once this diode becomes forward biased, uh, now I start to conduct some current through that diode. And um, then I have some voltage dropped across this resistor because of that current. But what's the, the maximum voltage I'm going to drop across that diode? It's going to be that voltage of a fully conducting diode, so about 0.7 volts. And as even if this voltage at the input increases and I have more and more current through it, that voltage will go up a little bit, a little bit more than 0.7, but not very much. So the curve here will then be in this part where it goes up to 0.7 volts and then it just flattens out. Uh, if you want to zoom in on it, this would be you know, increasing very, very slowly, but effectively just limiting. Um, the output to 0.7 volts. So that's how you get the positive voltage limit, and then just the opposite is occurring for the negative voltage limit with ILB2. Oops. So when I put, when I combine these and get the circuit that I circled at the top, then my output will be limited to a swing of negative 0.7 volts to positive. 0.7 volts, no matter what my input voltage is. Any questions on how this is working? Yes. Uh, you mean, so down here? Uh, no, because I'm only looking at the output across the diode. I mean, the vo sorry, the voltage across the diode. So the resistor is just there so that um, you have something for the to absorb the current. You, you, you could do it without the resistor there, but it's not the best design. Um, any other questions? So the important part of the circuit is not is not the resistor. It's it's the way that these diodes are, are positioned. Okay, so this is how we can make a limiter. But because our silicon diodes turn on at 0.7 volts, I'm just stuck at having an output limit uh, of positive 0.7 volts and negative 0.7 volts with this circuit. So what if but, but that might, may or may not be a useful voltage for you. So what if you want to set the limit to something other than 0.7 volts, positive or negative? How would you, how would you do that? Yes, you could do that. So if I redid this circuit, But I did this. Oops. Sorry, this is a, a third reverse bias diode here. So this is now my output. And this is my input. Okay, what's my what's my peak output voltage now? So it's going to be, because I have three diodes now, so I'm going to have 0.7 volts across, dropped across all of these. So my output 
range is going to be positive 2.1 volts, 3 times 0.7. And my negative one will be negative 2.1 volts. Okay, so I can just stack up a lot of diodes in order to get the voltage limit that I want at the output. But what if I don't want an output that's a multiple of 0.7? I could use different diodes because if I use different semiconductor materials, um, that, that voltage at which it turns on is going to be different. 0.7 volts is only for silicon at room temperature. So I could change that, that voltage that's dropped across the diode by changing the material. Um, but another way to do it is you just add a, a DC voltage um, to the limiter. So with this limiter, now the, the positive limit, I didn't draw the, the other side of the limiter, so now this only limits the positive voltage. But now you have you are going to get 0.7 volts dropped across that diode plus the 5 volts of this DC source. So now you set the output, the, um, the peak positive output, to 0.7 volts now. And if you wanted to make it a nice even 5 volts, then you just make this DC source 4.3 volts instead. This is not to get rid of fluctuations from your source. It's just to protect whatever is at the output. If, you're, if your voltage um, at the source becomes really high, it just protects whatever is at the output from seeing that high voltage. If I had, uh, so if I had, let's say, I look at my input voltage as a function of time, and Let's say I'm trying to set, this is, my, this is my positive limit, and that's my negative limit, okay? But I had some input voltage, and I want to output a sinusoid wave, but I had an input voltage that looks like that. So it has these fluctuations on it. This circuit doesn't get rid of those fluctuations, because those are below the voltage limits. But if my input voltage then had a big spike over here, where this, this extra voltage could damage whatever component I had to the output, the output of my, if I look at the output of my limiter, here's the positive peak. It's going to follow the input, including those fluctuations, as long as that input voltage is below that, that limiter. But once I get to this point, then the output of my limiter, or the limiter will limit the, the voltage at the output to not go past that point. So if I have small fluctuations on my, my input, it doesn't get rid of them. It's only protecting it from big spikes in voltage. Any other questions on this? Yeah. Oh yeah, this does this these graphs don't include this DC thing here. Okay. Um, so we, we can now set our our voltage limit to any value we want because we, we just added DC source there and we can control it. Um, but now we just made our circuit a little bit more complicated because I have to have another voltage source. So another way to make a limiter using only diodes, not having to, to put any more extra voltage source in there, um, are to use Zener diodes. And in this case, you're going to put Zener diodes, two Zener diodes in series, but uh, flipped in orientation. So at, for um, a given input voltage, one of the Zener diodes is going to be forward biased. If my input voltage is positive, say, that means that diode 
Z1 is going to be 4 biased. And you want uh, the other diode, Z2, uh, to be either in reverse bias uh, or in breakdown. So what will happen here is that um, if my uh, uh, input voltage is within the limits uh, of my of my current limiter, um, I'm just going to have uh, the voltage at the output track, the voltage at the input, because diode Z2, let's look at the positive side first, diode Z2 will be reverse biased, but not in breakdown. Diode Z1 is forward biased, but because diode Z2 is reverse biased, there's still no current that can flow through this path. So that current is equal to zero for this part of the curve. Okay, but once I get to the voltage limit that I want, I'm going to choose these zener diodes so that diode Z2 goes into breakdown, and uh, then that diode D2, sorry, Z1 becomes forward biased. So then I have some non-zero current through here because Z2 is into breakdown, and now diode Z1 is forward biased. So I have if this is a silicon zener diode, there's going to be 0.7 volts dropped across that. And diode Z2 is in breakdown, so my voltage is going to be given by that zener diode uh, voltage equation that we went over earlier. And the combination of these two voltages is going to set the uh, upper uh, li limit voltage of my limiter circuit. And then when diode, when I flip the, the polarity of my input voltage, then z diode Z1 is the one that goes into breakdown, and Z2 is forward biased. And that sets, sets the negative limit of the limiter. The reason why... Uh, you can use Zener diodes this way now in place of the uh, having that DC voltage source there is because uh, you can make Zener diodes so that you can con precisely control that breakdown voltage um, and it's not a material property setting it's now it's now how you make that diode so you can make a Zener diode out of silicon but you can design it to have a certain breakdown voltage. And so if you, you know, look at your, your catalog or whatever and you pick the, the right senior diodes, um, you can set your, your voltage limit um, by choosing the right ones. And you don't have to add another DC source there. Okay, um, the last diode circuit that I want to talk about is something called a clamping circuit and what you use this for is to add um, DC back to a signal so you have a, a purely AC signal no, no DC offset and if you want to add DC back to the signal you can use a clamping circuit and this this is another diode circuit and um, you might want to do this or, or the reason why you, you want to do this is because it might have a DC component of the signal might have some information on it. Um, this could be true for different kinds of uh, communication schemes. But you can lose DC when you uh, have the signal go through coupling capacitors. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about uh, transistor amplifiers. Um, but um, at least from, you know, based upon what we learned in 211, the uh, capacitors are going to be like open circuits at DC, right? So they're going to block DC, but they'll let AC through. And so that's how you would get, you can filter out DC by using a capacitor. When we look at amplifiers, we'll be using um, coupling capacitors um, in the amplifiers. So that would make you lose DC component of the circuit. And if you wanted to add that back at the end of the amplification, 
you can use a clamping circuit. So the clamping circuit kind of looks like the peak rectifier circuit, but now we're going to take the output voltage across the diode. So it's a capacitor uh, in series with a diode. And if we look at uh, what's happening, so let's say we had a uh, square wave at our input. It has a peak-to-peak -peak voltage of 10 volts, um, but it's a, it's, it has some, or it's an AC signal because it's going from negative 6 volts um, to 4 volts. I want to add some DC to it so that the signal goes from 0 volts to 12 volts for this square wave. Okay, and, and I can do that by running it through this clamping circuit um, that uses the diode. Okay, so what's going to happen is when my square wave is a negative voltage, um, that means that this side of the circuit is more negative. Okay, so my diode is going to be forward biased because uh, um, my, my current flow, although this is a ground, this point in the circuit is more negative, so my current's going to want to flow from ground to the more negative potential. Okay, so the diode is going to be forward biased. I'll have some current going that way, and that current is going to charge up the capacitor uh, when this voltage is negative. Uh, when the input voltage is greater than zero, so now um, this point in the circuit is more positive, so that current is not there anymore because the diode becomes reverse bias. Um, and then if I had a load resistor out here, then the capacitor, which was charging up before, uh, can now discharge through the load resistor. And as a result of all of that, I take the, the negative part of the signal and I just shift it up uh, to zero. And then I, I, I offset the, the positive part as well. So the whole signal just shifts up um, so that the, the lowest voltage is zero. And so in this particular circuit, um, we can say that it's clamping the minimum output voltage to zero volts. That's why it's called a clamping circuit. So if we look at um, all the circuits we, we've covered so far, uh, it's a pretty good list of circuits that you can build with diodes. Uh, we can, we've, we've looked at digital logic. Uh, we've looked at uh, rectifiers, different types of rectifiers, voltage regulators, um, limiters, and now clamping circuits. That all we can use that with just silicon diodes, PN junction diodes, um, everything applies to that so far. But we can also make uh, some more uses of diodes if we look at more specialized types of diodes. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about these uh, in a lot of detail because it's actually covered a little bit in 324, mostly in, in EE327, but we can also change how we make the diode so that it can do even more functions. So one type, one special type of diode is something called a Schottky barrier diode. Um, and the Schottky barrier diode, it's not a PN junction anymore. It's a metal on one side of the junction, and the other side is, is just a dope semiconductor. Uh, so usually it's an N-type uh, semiconductor. Now the behavior of the Schottky, ba uh, Schottky barrier diode is very similar to the PN junction diode. The IV curve still looks the same and, and everything like that, uh, except that you can switch across this type of diode faster. And we haven't covered enough device physics in this class to know why. Um, but it has to do with the capacitance um, that you would build up in the PN junction. Um, 
causing, you know, if you have a capacitance in a circuit that has a certain RC time constant, so that limits switching speeds, um, but you have less capacitance um, in this diode, so it can switch faster. So if you have uh, high speed circuits, then a lot of times they will use shot key barrier diodes instead of PN junction diodes. Um, because you're changing the material, it's also changing that voltage drop across this junction when it when it fully turns on. So for a shot key barrier diode, that voltage is usually lower uh, than a silicon junction diode. It's somewhere around 0.4 to 0.5 volts. Um, but a disadvantage is that the reverse bias current for the shot key barrier diode is larger than that of a, a PN junction diode. It's not a large current. It's still on the order of nanoamps, but it's larger than a PN junction diode. Okay, so that's one type, one special type of PN junction. Uh, another special type is something called a photodiode. And what a photodiode does is it allows you to convert the presence of light uh, to a change in uh, electrical current. So you can use this to sense the presence of light and how intense that light is. So the way that happens is you take a diode and you put a reverse bias across that diode. So remember our diodes, we had a, when we reverse bias it, there's that depletion region that's set up and we didn't uh, add any carriers in that depletion region. But if I shine light on this, light, um, as you learned in physics, light um, is made of photons and each photon has an energy of H nu. Those photon energies can generate electrons and holes, because they have energy, it can uh, create enough energy within this depletion region to generate electrons and holes in the depletion region. Those will move out of the depletion region, and because they're moving charges, that will be a current. And that current is only due to the fact that you have uh, light shining on it. So that's going to be um, something called photocurrent. And that will be proportional to how much light you have shining on it. The more light, the more photons, so the more of those, those charge carriers, those moving charge carriers you're going to make. So if you look at the output of a photodiode, and we look at the IV curve, so if it's in the dark, no light on it, it just looks like a regular diode curve. Very low current and reverse bias, and the exponentially increasing current if it's in forward bias. But if you shine light on it, the curve still looks the same, but you just shift it because you are adding current to this whole thing. And you're adding current uh, evenly, I mean, depending on how it's, how it's biased. So, for example, if I were to reverse bias this diode at this voltage, okay, so that means in the dark, I'm going to have this small amount of current flowing through my photodiode. But if I shine light on it, then I'm now going to have a larger amount of current flowing through my photodiode. And that means I can then uh, use that to determine the intensity of the light that's shining on my diode, and if there's light on it or not. Okay, so that's a, a photodiode. Um, if you don't reverse bias, the photodiode, then you can get a solar cell. So now I don't, I don't put any bias on it at all, and I'll just put a resistor uh, connected up to that PN junction. Now if I shine light on the PN junction, I still generate those charge carriers. They still move out of the depletion region because of that electric field. So it's still moving charge, and I'm going to get a current that flows through a load that I connect to that diode. So the, this type of uh, structure, remember I said for the diode, I'm not getting power from nothing if it's just sitting there. But in this case, I kind of am, as long as I have light shining onto it. If I connect the resistor across this PN junction, I will get a voltage and a current uh, through this resistor. 
And that's how a, a photovoltaic cell is working. Now the direction of the photo current then will produce a, a so here's my photo current because of the motion of the electrons and holes. That's going to make a, a voltage drop across my load. But if you look at the way that that voltage drop is, it's now going to start forward biasing this PN junction. And that means I should have a forward bias current going in the opposite direction of the photo current. So I don't get, um, the amount of current I'm getting out is not, uh, or that's getting delivered to my load is reduced a little bit by the amount of, of forward bias current that goes back. It's kind of self forward biasing it itself. But I'm still getting some, some power delivered to my resistive load uh, just because I started shining light on this PN junction. And then the final one is a light emitting diode. So I take a PN junction and I forward bias that PN junction. When I get now a, um, when I forward bias it, I'm injecting electrons and holes. Uh, into my PN junction. If I have something called a, a recombination event where that, that free electron loses its energy, the energy that it's lost can be emitted as a photon now. So before I was taking the photon energy and putting it into my PN junction, now I'm, I'm taking the energy of my, my charge carriers and I'm releasing that as photons. And that's how a, a light emitting diode works. It's just a forward biased PN junction. But in this case, you have to choose the materials carefully. If you forward bias a silicon diode, you are not going to get any light out of it um, because of the way that the, um, the uh, properties of the, the silicon is. You have to use um, another type of semiconductor that allows you to really efficiently produce these uh, these photons. And so here's some examples of those. Um, depending upon the type of semiconductor, that depends on, on what color you get. Okay, so that's it for today.